Jimmy Burns from Melbourne, Ohio, and you're listening to Barbecue Central. We'll do it live. Okay. Well, do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Oh. Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Good evening, and welcome to the Really Big Barbecue Central Show. This is the show that talks about all things important in the world of barbecue and grilling. We broadcast live and direct from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio. It's affectionately known as the barbecue capital of the North Coast. I'm your program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you aboard here on your Tuesday. If you have always wanted to get in touch with the show, you have something of value to bring this evening, you can hit me up on a phone call. You can also jot down an email and send it my way, and these are the two ways to do it. You can get in touch with the show by calling 216-220-0966. Email Greg at the BBQCentralShow.com. On the Twitter and Instagram, at BBQ Central Show. Everything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, and that address is thebbqcentralshow.com. And here's what's happening in case you didn't get the newsletter. Coming up in about 12 minutes from now, it is the second week of October, and whatever month we're in, when it is the second Tuesday of the month, you know we're going to get a visit. From the creator of the most heavily trafficked barbecue and grilling website on the face of the earth, I am talking about Meathead Goldwyn. And now, Meathead Goldwyn will be on location this evening, so I'm not sure exactly where he's going to be. There was some type of of, uh, event that the Sweet Baby Ray group was putting on. Of course, you would remember last week, We caught up with Deuce Raymond, and Deuce had his uncle, Dave Raymond, Sweet Baby Ray, for those people that have ever heard barbecue sauce before. Sweet Baby Ray made an impromptu surprise and phenomenal first visit, so we had to divvy up that segment, because initially I booked Deuce, and then... His uncle was there. How could I not talk to his uncle? Somebody I've always wanted to have on the show. One of the legends of the industry. Probably the best-selling sauce in the industry. I think he said last week, if you go back and listen to the show, that Sweet Baby Ray right now, the name or the brand, has like 46% share in the barbecue sauce market. Could you imagine having almost 50% market share of the barbecue sauce industry right now? You go up and down any aisle... In a grocery store. Well, not any aisle. But you go up and down an aisle where the barbecue sauce is located anymore. Is it 75% of that aisle? All different kinds. All different makes. Vegan friendly. No meat. No high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup. Peaches. Apricots. You name it. Liquid smoke. More liquid smoke. And then you have the rubs, and then you have the barbecue accoutrements. If it's not at least one full grocery store aisle, it might be getting into two. It's got its own section in some of these places. Have 50% of that market on the sauce side almost. Wow, that's incredible. Anyway, I've diverged. Meathead Goldwyn will be joining us, and he is on location. So I'm not sure exactly how he's set up. I'm not saying that Meathead isn't technically savvy, but... You know, me and being on remote, if it was that easy, I would be on remote like all the time. But having done the show and wanting to bring a quality sounding production to you each and every week, I don't really venture out of the studio because within these confines, I know I can control pretty much how everything sounds. Now, 
can I control when Skype shuts off every three minutes because it's not really me, but there's a guest issue. I can't control that. We try and work through some of those things. Are there sometimes logistic or technical issues on my end that I just can't work around or they're happening live and we just have to muscle through it? Absolutely. Some people would say it happens all the time. Some people started a drinking game back in the day when we used to have technical issues. They were happening so much. But by and large, over the last number of years, we've ironed out a lot of that stuff. I have professional sound people that have contracted with me. Shout out to my official sound guy, Haniel. What's good, Haniel? So we've ironed out a lot of these technical issues. But when the guest is in charge of going on location, well, all bets are off at this point. So we'll see what Meat had up his sleeve at the 914 to 935 segment. Then we'll move to the second hour. You would recall last week that I talked at length with one Ray Lampy Dr. Barbecue for the S Dr. Barbecue segment. And he made it a point to say that there was, however major or minor, some kind of an internet dust up about the term pork belly burnt ends. And from Ray's standpoint, he does not believe you can use the term burnt end as it relates to pork because, as he had said here on the show last week, burnt ends are made and born out of brisket. So you can't use or usurp the term burnt ends and supplant it in front of anything you want. Rib burnt ends, bacon burnt ends, burger burnt ends. Pork burnt ends, pork belly burnt ends, blah, blah, blah. The list could go on and on, of course. So I said it would be great since we've had Ray to get the other side of the argument, which is Matt Pittman, creator of Meat Church. He'll be on at 1014. So a lot of really cool stuff that we can talk to Matt about if you follow Meat Church on social media. You know, they're huge on Instagram, over 130 some odd thousand followers. They're really big on the Twitter as well. That is really leverage social media to grow the brand and get exposure and all that stuff. So I think there's some really good information that just from a social media marketing standpoint, all of us could use, especially if we're looking to better the image and grow our particular brand, some high level stuff that he might be able to share with us. But more importantly, of course, in the impetus of the segment, what his view, because he was on the other side of pork belly burn end, doesn't see an issue with it, doesn't know what the big deal is, or why there's being a big deal made of it. So we'll talk to him about his side of it and where it's going to go from here. And maybe he's surprised. I have to be honest, I'm really surprised that pork belly burn ends have become such a rage all over social media. It is the food darling of the barbecue and grilling community when it comes to social media. I don't think there's any doubt about it. It's very popular. It's really caught on very quickly. I don't know if it's going to evaporate just as quickly or if we'll still be talking about pork belly burn ends by the end of the year, or if that's going to be the trend that showed up out of nowhere. And then as quickly as it has emerged, it is evaporated. But we'll see. Time will tell. Matt Pittman, 1014. And then at 1035, of course, the Sam's Club National Barbecue, or I'm sorry, the Pro, ugh, the National Pro Barbecue Tour presented by Sam's Club's national final event took place this past weekend in Bentonville, Arkansas. And winning that one and joining me at 1035 is Q and Stew and Bruins Pitmaster Scott Smith. So we're going to talk to him about the big weekend, the big win, of course. Get that insider's look into his camp when they left Georgia, when they loaded into Bentonville, all that good stuff. And then what it's like going up with 49 teams that have a legitimate shot at winning, I think, to date, like the most payout at a barbecue competition. I think World Food Championships in the end will probably claim that crown. But in regards to just straight up barbecue competitions, I don't know if anybody makes more money than they do at Sam's Club when they win it. Plus, Factor in the regional round, factor in the local round. If you do really well in all three, that's a pretty big take. When you look at it comparatively to some of those other contests that are out there, three contests, you can win a lot of money if you have your cards played right. So Scott Smith, Kewen, Stewen, and Bruin helping me close out the show this evening. Very much looking forward to that. 
All right, folks, let everybody know that the show is on. Share it. Get on the Twitter, the Facebooks, all that stuff. You can watch the show live on the video, facebook.com slash BBQ Central Show, outdoorcookingchannel.com slash watch dash now has the video feed as well, also on Roku. Of course, the easiest way to get it after the fact is subscribing through any of the podcast directories, iTunes, Google Play Music. Or as I mentioned, there's like a billion podcast fetchers, aggregators, whatever you want to call it. Just go to my website and grab the subscribe navigation bar and uh, you're off and running. What can I tell you? You'll never miss a segment of the show. You'll never miss a guest of the show. Maybe you've listened to the show live and you want to go back and listen to it again. Easy way to do it. It's how most people get it. Folks, grilling season is still open for business, whether you believe in these dates of grilling season or not. I think it's poppycock. The place you need to go for all your barbecue and grilling needs, Butcher Barbecue, right? Certainly, we know that Butcher's carries a great selection of barbecue products like rubs and injections and marinades. One of my favorite things is this grilling oil that I can tell you about each and every week. The thing that I really enjoy the most, the thing that brings me the most value when it comes to the grilling oils is the fact that they are shelf stable. So a lot of these other items, you open them first and then it has the wording that's very small in the front of the label that says refrigerate after opening. You know what's going to happen. Even if you really love it and you really tell yourself, I got to remember that it's in the refrigerator. You cap it back up, you put it in the refrigerator, and then a couple days later, you're moving stuff around because you got to make stuff for new stuff, room for new stuff. Uh-oh, well, that piece of culinary delightfulness is now getting ever so gently pushed back and pushed back. Two weeks later, you forget about it. A month later, you're cleaning out the refrigerator, and you're like, ah! I really wanted to use, well, now I got to throw it up. You don't have to worry about that with grilling oil. You leave it right out on the counter, you can take it out with you to the grill or the barbecue pit or however you're going to use it. It's not going to go bad. It's not going to go rancid. So it's never out of sight, out of mind, right? The other thing that's new over at Bar uh, Butcher Barbecue is the new Grilling Addictions Seasoning. Good pepper, good salt, good little back-end heat there, good all-around rub, especially on the burgers and the chicken, your traditional grilling type stuff. Be sure to pick up a bottle of that as well. Lastly... I say it each and every week, dealers want it. If you currently own a barbecue grilling and supply store and you don't carry the butcher's lineup, what are you waiting for? Hit up butcherbbq.com right now. Request information on how to become a dealer for them. Not only will they thank you, but your customers will reap the rewards by getting these fine products in their hands to try for themselves. These products are extensively tested both in the backyard and on the competition trail so you know they're going to work, of course. Head on over to ButcherBBQ.com right now and check out all of their products. Again, it's ButcherBBQ.com. You'll be happy that you visited. Butcher Barbecue, always trust your butcher, longtime sponsor of this show. And we will be back with Meathead Goldwyn from Parts Unknown somewhere in the greater Chicagoland area. So stick around for that. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show right here on the Barbecue Central Networks. Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Radio Network Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. All right, welcome back. The 2017 grant program from Smithfield was a raging success this season. So... If you want your event to be considered for 2018, head to SmokinWithSmithfield.com right now and apply for the 2018 grant program. Don't be left out. Applications being taken now until October 25th, so just a couple weeks left. Again, don't miss out. Don't do it. Also, uh, if you follow me on the Facebooks, you will be able to find the Smithfield grant program application or rules, whatever I'm going to be posting that here at some point, either this evening or later tomorrow, but I was 
advanced a copy of that by the folks over at Smithfield as well. So be on the lookout for that if you want to have your event or competition considered for the 2018 Smithfield Grant Program. All right, joining me now is the creator of the Amazing Ribs website, the most heavily trafficked barbecue and grilling website ever. Meathead Goldwood. Meathead, how are you, buddy? Hey, I'm great. Can you hear me and uh, see me? Uh, well, I saw you there for a second, but I can certainly hear you, so it's 50% good. All right, I'm trying to get the camera to show not go. me, but what's oh. in front of me. Can you? Uh, I... I um... I'm not. Oh, wait, wait. There we go. I think that did it. Can you see? Ah, there you go. Can oh, you see that? Oh, oh. Look at that. That looks like pumpkin roll. Oh, uh, yes. It looks exactly like. What it is. Uh, what's that in the front? Is some type of an apple tart of some sort? Yeah, it's a fruit tart. Fruit yeah, tart. with a crumble topping. Very good. I don't. That looks like some sort of a. Uh, a Is that like stuff. a? Where's Chef? Like Chef, a get Chef Mark in stuffed here. Stuffed pastry of some sort? Yeah, oh, let me tell you what's dear. going on. Yeah. I didn't want to cancel on you, but I had a chance for a hell of a free dinner. So <laughs> we're <laughs> you don't turn down free dinner. I heard that. I am at um, Sweet Baby Ray's restaurant just outside Chicago in Wooddale, Illinois. And uh, Sweet Baby Ray, Dave Raymond and I are all drinking buddies. And uh, his uh, nephew, Deuce, who is the chef here. And I know you had them both on last week. Can you believe that? Yeah, wait, great coincidence, and uh, uh, I'm up there at their restaurant hanging out with them. They do three or four educational events, um, and tonight was one of them, and I videotaped all the seminars they did. He had about 20 or 30 people here, and Deuce did a demonstration of fall cooking. And one of the things I love about some of these barbecue chefs like Deuce is they go outside the box. They just don't do your standard brisket and pulled pork and ribs. And he did a series of really creative appetizers, a wonton roll mm. with brisket on it, and then a little sauce and an apple chutney. Um, he did all kinds of fun stuff. And then he demonstrated how he does turkey. I'm walking over here to the cutting board I'm waiting for Deuce or Chef Mark to come back here. Oh, but, that, uh, that looks like turkey. Yeah, he did. He did oh. three or four different techniques on turkey. Among them, a deep-fried Cajun turkey tonight. Is that it? And I, ta I taped it all. <laughs> I'm going to try to have it on my website on YouTube in a couple of days. But it, 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 it's a lot of fun. They've got themselves a big old Southern pride uh -huh. here. And let me, let me show you something that I think is really cool. Um... Can you see that sign? See it, smell it, taste it, live it. If it's wrong, fix it. This is a sign they have posted all over their This is, I mean, their kitchen. This is a restaurant kitchen. If it's wrong, fix it. This is a restaurant kitchen that takes quality um, uh, in a high command. And look at what else I saw. This is cool. Hey, that's, that's, it's Meathead's that's meat the, magnet right that's there. That's Come look on, at you. I'm the temperature guy right here on the wall here. Um, and it's just a neat place. And they did this cooking demo. Now I'm going to try to walk you out into the dining area. I think I'm going to vomit. <laughs> Am I making you nauseous? A little, but that's all right. So it's kind of breaking up. I oh, mean, dear. Been doing Look this at this. Are you just forcing here. these people into a live video? I'm sure they're very yeah, appreciative. Yeah, we're doing live video. Oh, dear. And uh, this is uh, th th these are people who came for the presentation. It's kind of breaking up. Yeah. It's dessert time, um, and uh, we've had our uh, chance to sit and listen to Deuce, Chef Deuce. There's Dave and, Raymond right there. Uh, Dave Raymond, where is Dave? I don't see him. No. Oh, wasn't that him that just walked by? No, or no, no, it's another big guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's right here, Chef Deuce. Hello, Deuce. Hello. Say hello. Stand still. Stand still for 30 seconds. Hey, look, there he is. Third place for Deuce this past weekend, by the way. Third place for Deuce, yes. He, he knows that you took third place this past weekend, Deuce. Yes, I know. More importantly, first place with teams five or less competitions in there the whole country. Show Can karma. You hear that? Show karma, baby. I'm excited about that. That's right. Can you hear what he was just That's saying? That's right. First in teams that have uh, competed five times or less. Yeah. Yeah. But what, what, what he did tonight was he showed us uh, fall recipes and fall dishes. And go ahead, dude. Um, send Chef Mark out. He has a platter 
of the appetizers I wanted to show the audience. And get his, he's hiding, I know. He knows Meat, we're on the air. Get him out here. Meathead, while you're, uh, while you're trying to uncover uh, the chef over here, do you have a stated opinion or a stated thought on what fall cooking means to you? Well, I mean, fall cooking, all cooking, if you ask me, and I think if you ask any chef who is worth the salt, is seasonal. When... Um, Apples are in season as they are now. You cook with apples. Um, when squash is in season, you cook with squash. Um, and I think that's important. You get fresh. I mean, come on, fresh tomatoes. I mean, all through the summer, I live in Illinois, and we are a state that really knows how to cook, how to grow corn, tomatoes, vegetables. So we put up with winter, and in order to get incredible corn and I like peaches Michigan peaches I hope your audience doesn't have any Georgia or South Carolina listeners because I gotta tell you Michigan peaches kick their butt really and it, well it's it's it, all right here we go it's related to climate and when you air it a cool climate hot climates fruit ripens which means it gets sweet but at night the temperature is really hot and when the temperature is really hot it burns off the acidity. Mm. And the secret to great fruit, wine, peaches, apples, is a balance of acidity and sugar. And so when you get, I mean, there is no better um, peach in the country, I think. I've eaten them in South Carolina. I've eaten them in Georgia. Michigan peaches are the best peaches I've ever eaten. So um, here we are in the north, and the frozen north. Corn, same deal. So you eat seasonal, and so that's what he was teaching today, is he was teaching seasonal cooking, and um, uh, he, uh, they served um, a, a chicken thigh skewer with an apple concentrated drizzle, they served a wonton with shredded brisket, um, they served um, a Belgian endive leaf with a um, goat cheese, uh, sort of um, a whipped goat cheese in it, and some bacon. It's definitely, and I think it's uh, very creative. This is not your normal barbecue food. I was just going to say, it's definitely not something that uh, the norm would be found in. No, no. no. I just lost my video feed. Are you still with me? Uh, I am still here. The feed uh, did hold for a moment, but uh, once it gets regained, we'll go ahead and switch back over. Uh, well, I'm waiting for Chef Mark, who's our executive chef. I asked him to make a platter of all the appetizers we had about two hours ago. Yeah. Because they're really beautiful. And he's, and he, I, I think he's gotten gun shy and he's hiding. So is this event he's, something that uh, these people had to sign up for in advance, or are they invites because they're socialites? What's the deal? It's um, if you go to the Sweet Baby Ray restaurant, not the Sweet Baby Ray sauce, they're different, and they probably talked about that last week. The sauce is owned bound by a big multinational corporation. Yep. And Dave Raymond, who invented it, owns a restaurant or two under his name and a barbecue competition team and um he um does some really creative stuff so to get on the list go to the sweet baby ray restaurant site in wooddale illinois get on their mailing list and they'll let you know when they're doing these seminars and they do several a year and deuce who you saw a minute ago is very creative. I mean, he's. Just, I mean, they do well in competition, so they can cook brisket. But he can, he can, he can do fun stuff. I mean, he did um, a turkey breast that he's that he seasoned with Cajun seasoning, tossed it in a deep fryer until it was deep golden, mm. tempted it. It wasn't quite done, and then popped it in the smoker to give it a finish of smoke. And that was oh was it was it done on purpose for the finish of smoke or was it done in the, the smoker well, you know, to finish? It's one it? of those things you can't always control. Yeah. Oh, I think I've I've got you back visually here. Can yeah. You, I I can see you. So I'm sitting at the back of the room waiting for Chef Mark to show up, and I don't know where he is. Yeah, he actually had to go. He had to go. Oh, he had to go. Of 
course. He knew it, son of a bitch. I'm going to crack his Oh, butt. Meathead, what are you talking? <laughs> We're live We're on the there. air. <laughs> Holy moly. Look at this guy dropping <laughs> dropping SOBs well, left no, and right. I mean, I wow. wasn't going to come out and show this stuff. Yeah, well, that's all right. I mean, we, we, he, I, he was supposed to. We did get a shot of was, the uh, pumpkin roll, and it looked delicious. He was supposed to do a platter. This lady has no idea on she's each, on live right yeah, now. Yeah, she's a sweetheart. She's a, uh, he was supposed to do a platter with one each of the appetizers for me to show on this show. Okay, yeah, you I know can, where they are? I can find out for you. And I can See if you can find them, and maybe add some of the other food. Yeah, oh, here we go. Guess what, Meathead? She's out of here. some hands here. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, yeah, I'll see you never again. Uh, Boom, yeah, I'm out of right, here. Right, right, right. Yeah. She's not going home with that guy. Hey, I can tell you that. Meathead, um, is is it safe to assume that the Sweet Baby Ray's restaurant does use Sweet Baby Ray's sauce in the restaurant? S safe to assume, but <laughs> Deuce, his nephew, yeah. has created his own line of sauces. Right, Deuce is wild. And they're very nice. And one of them, his competition sauce is a ringer for you know what yeah you know, the right, famous right, right. popular yes. uh, blue in color blues hog, right. uh, it's a glaze it's a it's an herbal season spicy glaze in the blues hog profile and uh, it's very good i like it a lot and it's a good competition sauce and they win awards with it in fact wait a minute what do you got in your hand show me what you got look um, at that Texas rub. Uh, the Texas rub. And, okay, you didn't get any sauces? No sauces. Go back and buy some sauces. <laughs> I eat here for lunch every week. Oh, he eats oh, here for lunch. There you go. How much was your book? I never, I never asked. Pardon uh, me? Hey, Meathead, we're in the, the middle of a freaking show here. Tell that guy to oh, beat it. Shut up. I'm it's selling books. They're 35 <laughs> Lord. They're 35 bucks. Yeah. yeah. They're 20 bucks on Amazon. But you don't get my signature. You don't get my signature. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. And he's walking uh, we'll away see. crying now. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I did a little presentation after Deuce and uh, talked about uh, cooking turkey and how I like to do it. And uh, uh, some people wanted to buy the book. So Meathead, um, do, when you're in something like impromptu like this, what are the, the your go-to items that you talk about? Um, I always fall back on thermometers. I mean, your audience is savvy and experienced. Oh, he's making a pork shank platter. Oh, he's making a pork shank. Yes, I do. Yeah, Deuce, Deuce made Deuce, 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 Here, I'm, I'm just not going to wait for him to bring it out. I'm coming back here. I'm in the kitchen now. There's oh, Deuce. Oh, dear. And look at this. Deuce does. Wow. Deuce, tell us a little bit of how you do these pork shanks because they were ungodly good. These are a smoked pork shank. First of all, they're Berkshire, so you know they're good. They're really rich. It's got that nutty, fresh flavor. Can you hear him all right? Yeah, you could stand closer to him, though, to help okay, him out. Okay, I can stand closer. All right. All right, go ahead. So they're Berkshire pork shanks. They're really got that deep red color, really well marbled. And what we did was we brined them overnight with bourbon, honey, water, salt, and sugar. Mm-hmm. Then we seasoned them, took them out of the brine, seasoned them with our pork rub, smoked them for three hours. Then we put them into a braise with mirepoix, celery, onion, carrots, a little bit of leeks, a little bit of fennel, and water, and cooked them for four more hours until they're just very tender. You can see it's just going to come right off the bone. And then... Uh, and they do. I mean, if, 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 if I were to reach out and touch these things, <laughs> they would just crumble right yeah. off the bone. Wow. Yeah. And then we served them with little horseradish mashed potatoes and some roasted root vegetables with lavender honey. Oh. There, and his uh, what he did with the mashed potatoes are lavender. fun. Everybody's had garlic mash, yeah. right? Right. I mean, I do garlic mash. Everybody does garlic mash. He did horseradish mash, which wow. I'd never had before, and it was killer. I really liked it. I'm a if I were not meathead, I would be potato head. Well, I mean, from a <laughs> from a presentation standpoint, here it's on that piece of wood. You got those two monster yeah, pork yeah, shanks, yeah, nice. the potatoes. Uh, the instant chat room is just going berserk, saying that they want it. That looks awesome. Uh -huh, and by the uh -huh. way, I mean, while he said he went to culinary school for four years, I think we're getting a whole new appreciation for Deuce Raymond today from a week ago, and seeing what yeah. he's actually creating. Very impressive. Yeah, very. He's, he's he's speaking of how uh, you know he does a, this live 
broadcast there's a chat room and they're yeah. they're 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 they, they like what they see. <laughs> yeah. well, here, let's take a piece off here. Oh dear, yeah, look at that. Down. Oh, it's not fair. Look at the color in that. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, just stick some right up to Meathead's phone and let me eat it. Oh my yeah. lord. I, I think the lesson here is we've got a real chef, not just a barbecue cook. Right. And so he's taking the skills and the techniques that a barbecue cook has learned, and he's applying it to all manner of cooking, plus the skills that a, a, a culinary trained chef learns. And so he's doing fun that. things with the root vegetables. I'm just looking around where it, you know dinner's over and people are going home. And I'm just looking for, oh, hey, look at these turkey pieces over here. This is that smoked pepper crusted turkey. Here's a, uh, a smoked pepper crusted turkey. He's kind of treated it like pastrami. Now, a lot oh. of barbecue joints do serve turkey. So yeah, this is uh, not yeah too, of course. Not too off the hook, but he does it really nicely and really effectively. How, how long has that turkey been sitting out? How long has it been sitting out? This has been about 45 minutes. I mean, Everyone just, went through the buffet. They were eating. They had to listen to Meathead for like 30 minutes. Oh, and, and they had got cold while they were listening. I mean, to but it, it still looks incredibly juicy. Yeah, it is. It is. Wow. The guy knows how to cook. And I, you know what? All right, let's get philosophical. Deuce is, a, is one of a kind. He's special. But he's not alone. The barbecue world, and I think, you know, among your listeners, people in the uh, chat room and out elsewhere, there are some barbecue cooks who know how to cook more than barbecue. Yeah. And they're applying the techniques and the concepts, and they're going beyond. And I think if you go to some of the... Deuce, you hear me talking. What are some of the barbecue joints that you know of where the cooks are like you, well, where I they're experimenting, where they're creating, where they're going beyond your KCBS four meats? But the two guys that come to my mind that have chef backgrounds are Charlie McKenna from Lily's Cube. Yep, here in Chicago area. He Johnson Wales, I believe. Mm -hmm. He's a trained culinary chef. He worked at one of the finest uh, fine dining restaurants in Chicago, True. And he's an excellent, excellent chef. He does some great things at his barbecue restaurant. His sides are phenomenal. He makes his own Chicago style hot link that is excellent. Mm. And he does a really great job. And he, he competes at a very high level. He, I think he really only does Memphis in May, but out of the last 10 years, I, I think he told me he was top 10 in pork shoulder uh, eight of the last 10 years at Memphis in May, wow. which mm -hmm. is a very huge accomplishment. He does, he does well in pork shoulder. Every the year. other guy that I think has a classical chef background is Tuffy Stone. That's correct. Oh, that's correct. Of course. And yeah. Tuffy does, obviously, he does awesome on competition. I've never been to one of his restaurants or anything, no, but, neither have I. but he is a trained chef. And he uses that to exceed, excel in his barbecue. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, Tuffy is, um, you know, the ultimate, yeah. the ultimate. One of the other guys uh, that's a classically You're trained chef and that is considered to have one of the best restaurants in the Kansas City area, by the way, is Robert McGee, formerly of Munch and Hogs at the Hilton, the former KCBS team of the year. But now he owns Q39 in Kansas City, which is widely considered to be one of the best restaurants in Kansas City. But that's another culinary trained real chef who's doing the barbecue thing and doing it very well what's his name again robert mcgee robert mcgee yep. and q in the city q39 is his I restaurant I've heard of him q39 of oh wait yeah, a minute i've heard of q39 yeah just because of the show i've heard of it yeah, yeah because of your deuce listens too i got alert He's you, a big by fan. the way i just got the low battery alert i uh i risked yeah. my battery because I taped Deuce doing all his demos yeah. instead of saving my battery for you. Oh, well, um, I don't know whether to be you, you know, you uh, can, humbled or what. Too. Yeah, all right, so is that, that, then that's it for us? I'm going to have to take care of All right, Deuce has got to go. All right. Bye, Greg. There is a chance that you're going to lose me um, uh, if my battery dies. And then you're on your own, pal. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we're going to take a break here real quick. I got to do a little bit of a bill pay, and then we'll see if we have Meathead on the backside of this. He is at the Sweet Baby Ray's uh, restaurant in, I believe you said Wooddale. So stick around and see if Meathead is going to be with us after the break. I'm going to talk to you quickly about the CHOPS Power Injector System, the National Barbecue Association's 2015, 2016, 2017, probably 2018 tool of the year. 
Each of their patent-pending CHOPS power injector systems features not one, not two, but four needles evenly spaced at the perfect distance for even injecting. It also comes with three plug screws so you can use fewer needles or change the spacing to get around those bones. It's versatility. You have three different sizes to choose from, the half-gallon CHOPS power injector system and the one-gallon CHOPS power injector system. Each one comes with a whole bunch of really cool stuff. The half gallon is 100 bucks, plus you pay the shipping. The one gallon is 120 bucks, plus you pay the shipping. Then you have the newest one to the fold, the Chops Full Power Injector System. It's electric. It's the commercial and competition Big Daddy. Not a holding tank this time like the other two, but a three and a half foot pickup tube that you can put in any size container. From a few ounces to a 55 gallon drum, it was designed for Chef Rob at the best barbecue restaurant in Kansas City. He has said time and time again that with the Chops Full Power Injector System, his briskets are better than ever. We were just talking about Chef Rob, by the way. It comes with metal needle adapters, a whole bunch of different gauge needles. It's $325 bucks plus shipping anywhere. A number of the top pitmasters in the world use the Chops Power Injector System to make their barbecue better than the rest because you can get flavor in every bite and you can do it quickly. It's not just for meat. How about alcohol-infused watermelon? Sure, why not? Every injector hand-assembled right there in Kansas City, Missouri, USA. You want extra accessories, they got them. You want to shoot medium-ground spices, they can help you with that. Best thing to do is visit the website, barbecuekansascity.com. That's B-A-R-B-E-Q-U-E, barbecuekansascity.com. And check out the CHOPS Power Injector System from there. You will wonder how you ever injected with one needle after you try the CHOPS Power Injector System just one time. The time it will save you is incredible. All right, Meathead coming back. I see him on my Skype still, so we'll see how much time we have with Meathead on the way back. Stick around. We'll be right back. Ready to get on the air. Call 216-220-0966. Now, let's get back to the LeBron James and Barbecue Talk. Craig Rampey. This portion of the show being brought to you by Green Mountain Grills, manufacturers of some of the best pellet cookers out there on the market today. If you're looking for a big cooker to house a lot of food, they got one for you. How about something medium-sized? No problem. Got you covered. Small for tailgates. We are in the midst of tailgate season. They can certainly do that as well. Plus pellets to fire those cookers. Check them out at GreenMountainGrills.com. I love my Green Mountain Grills. You can love yours as well. Plus, I really love the pizza insert. It's so awesome. Ooh. So good. All right. We are back with Meathead Goldwyn, who is in the Sweet Baby Ray's confines. And is it Wooddale, Illinois, Meathead? Wooddale? Yes. All and right. ask me how much I love you. How much do you love me, Meathead? I love you so much that yep. I missed the dessert tray. Oh. I got I did not Look get you. any of the pumpkin roll. I did not get any of the desserts. I just got screwed. Meathead. Oh, well. You know, uh, you I don't, know I don't, but I'm having fun. I I wanna, mean, it was a great crowd, and everything was beautiful, and I did get dinner. Well, dinner's the most, I mean, I saw those pork shanks. That had to be better than any dessert. That was spectacular. Yeah. And here we got some of the folks who were hanging out late. Yeah, look at that. I'm sure they look hey, very happy. So look at this guy, Phil, who's a, who's a KCBS judge. Yeah. And 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 now most people have on their iPads pictures of their family. Phil, <laughs> show us what your family looks like, Phil. Show show us your your wife. Show us your kids. Uh, there we are. Yeah. yeah Phil's Wait. iPad has nothing but meat on it. That's right. That's a true judge right there. <laughs> Phil, how many how many KCBS events have you judged? Ninety-nine. Oh, Ninety-nine. He's coming up on the century mark. So, is he a certified, uh, or is he a master judge? Are you a master judge, Phil? Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah like that was this dumb question. Uh, four judges. Huh? Less than 160 that are at 100. There, he says out of four thousand plus judges, there's like a, a few hundred that. Uh, uh, 20, all right, whatever. 20,000 judges. I just got the low battery alert, Greg. You might lose me. All right. That, that's all You're right. going to lose me any minute now, Greg. Meathead, before... Scott, it's Scott, right? Yeah, this is Scott. He's another KCBS judge. How many have you done, Judge? Scott? 90. Wow. So you're way these guys behind. Are, look, these guys are professionals. Right. Oh, look. She made me a little dessert platter. There's one To go. That's very nice. 
Meathead, nice. let me let me get your. Uh, I'm moving away before Scott takes it. Let me let me get your opinion on this before we lose you, and we'll probably lose you right yeah. in the middle of it. Well, I'll st I'll stick around till the battery dies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the last couple weeks, we have talked a, a lot about this phenomena of pork belly burnt ends. Uh, so oh, yeah. much so that Ray Lampy and another guy on Twitter had a little bit of a uh, internet dust up, if you will, because there was a school of thought, this is Ray's school of thought, that the term burnt ends specifically relates to brisket. And yeah. the, the product burnt ends is something that comes off brisket, which we, uh, we obviously yes. know. But now you have pork belly burnt ends, and Ray's yeah. stance is you can't call it a burnt end because it's not coming off of a brisket. This is coming off of pork. It is not brisket. So we don't want to bastardize or homogenize terms in the barbecue world. We want to make sure that we... That is incredibly loud in the background. Meathead, go stand in the refrigerator so I can hear. Um, I'm losing you, Greg. Yeah. Wait, wave at me when you want me to jump in on the burnt end subject. Yeah, so... Can we call pork belly burnt ends burnt ends, or can does it have to be brisket in order to be burnt ends, and should we call it something else? Well, I mean, I will always defer to Ray Lampy. Um, Ray Lampy is both right and wrong. But um, <laughs> one second, what's that, Phil? I'm going to be a few minutes. Okay. Um, he's both right and he's wrong. I mean, but on the other hand, what they call burn ends in competition now is they peel the point off the brisket and then cube it and make burn ends out of it. Now, originally the burn ends were the edges of the brisket that overcooked, and that would normally be the end of the flat, not the point. And it would overcook, and they would cut those off and chop those up. So, you know, what we call burn ends from brisket now is a little bit removed from the original concept. So what's wrong with calling pork burn ends? I, the, the, you know, the, I think the burn end <laughs> cooking concept has evolved, let's say. And uh, I don't see anything wrong with the pork belly burnt end idea today but it is technically wrong to call them burn ends kind of like a chicken fajita okay there you go and i you know by the way um i have a really nice short video on how to make pork belly burn ends with a recipe for making pork belly burn end banh mi sandwiches on the website um because they make incredible banh mi sandwiches what's a what's a banh mi banh mi is a all right Vietnamese sandwich. Vietnam, as you probably recall, especially if you watch the uh, PBS broadcast on Vietnam, Banh Mi, uh, Vietnam was occupied by the French. And it means essentially bread. Uh, but the French taught the Vietnamese how to make baguettes. Hmm. And so they made baguettes with crispy chunks of pork and beef and chicken and usually pickles. They made um, uh, pickled daikons and pickled watermelon rind and stuff. And it's a, uh, you can find it in a lot of metropolitan areas, banh mi, B-A-N-H, mi, M-I, sandwiches. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they're wonderful. It's sort of a submarine sandwich on a, on a, on a long roll with um, pickles, quick pickles, onions, uh, daikons. <laughs> And uh, cubes of meat and pork belly bon uh, burn ends are phenomenal bon mi sandwiches. And I got the recipe on the website. All right. So uh, you would go to amazingribs.com for that. Um, I've heard of it. Yeah. You were talking. You, I forget where we uh, diverged off that, but I was saying when you, <laughs> when you do these uh, impromptu talks, you talk about thermometers, but are there like a standard run of questions that you get from the audience that you're constantly answering? Yeah, I mean, okay, that's a great question, Greg, because I always start with thermometers. I always try to teach people cooking is all about temperature control. And if, if you can't control your temperature, if you don't know what the temperature of your oven is or your grill or your smoker, if you know what temperature the meat is, you're not cooking. And so those grills, I mean, even the best Weber grills, those dial thermometers in the top are just not reliable. 
you can't tell what the temperature is up in the dome unless you plan to eat the dome. You need to know what the temperature is down by the meat on yeah. the surface. And, and so I just I preach thermometers, thermometers, thermometers. And one of these days I'll start preaching scales um, so that we start weighing things instead of measuring them by volume. Mm, but right. um, that's like my favorite mantra because there's nothing that will improve a cook faster than starting to use a thermometer. You- um, beyond that, um, I, um, I teach two-zone cooking. I um, mean, most people don't have smokers. Most people have grills. And I teach them, you know, set up your grill with a hot zone and a non-hot zone. Push all the charcoal to one side. Or if you're on a gasser, turn on one burner and turn off the others. And, oh, I got the radio out of the way. I moved into another room. Um, and um, so, I mean, it's such an amazing idea. I just got some communications from South Africa where they love barbecue almost as much as this country. But in South Africa, they just spread the coals all across the bottom. Everything is coals underneath. The idea of setting up a two zone, a hot zone and a not hot zone is completely foreign to them. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, that's a really important concept. And it's very foreign to most Americans. They just don't think that you need to have temperature control by having a hot zone and a not hot zone, or that you should cook indirect and then cook direct. That you can, I mean, different kinds of heat, radiant heat versus convection heat. So those are topics that I really dry, try to teach. They're basic core concepts. Once I teach that, then uh, uh, people, the lights go on. Do you think meat had the charcoal grills? I mean, I, it, it almost sounds weird for me to say out loud that, that they're becoming more popular or they're re-emerging is, is more popular than they were, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. It seemed like it was just all gas grill all the time. And now, for instance, if you're in your uh, your pitmasters club, gas grills almost seem to be poo-pooed on to a certain degree, uh, more for a lack of flavor aspect, uh, things of this nature. Is there room? Well, A, do you see a re-emergence of the popularity of the charcoal grill, is it something that I just think is getting more popular again and it's not really? And what do you still think about gas grills? I don't know the direct answer to that, but um, um, uh, hold on one second. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on. Li- I'm Jeez. live on the air right now. These mother okay. effers are interrupting. <laughs> don't they know who I am, Meathead? They want to buy a book for I'm trying to make a living here. I'm, I'm doing a show trying to make a living. Are you yeah, kidding they me? They don't get it. I, Unbelievable. So, um, uh, I think there may be some truth to that. Max will know better than I, and you have Max on once a month. He reads the statistics from the Hearth Patio Barbecue mm-hmm. Association mm-hmm. and the others, and they'll tell you whether that's true or not. It seems like it may be. Oh, well, all right. There you go. Meat heads out. Get that big stuff out of here. It was really only a matter of time. I can't believe that we had him on almost all the way through that segment. So let's review exactly what happened for a segment and two-thirds, I would say. First of all, there's probably at least half of you that are like, thank God, he got dumped. (laughs) I'll admit, um, there were portions of that that were, you know, fairly uh, brutal, uh, perhaps is the right term. But again, you know, I'm trying to continually push the envelope of where the show is. And believe it or not, Meathead's a very popular guest every month. And I get a lot of email overnight and over the next week or so every time he comes on. And he said, I don't want to not do the show. I'm going to be live at some place. Maybe we can figure it out. And again, I said, use, if you're going to have your iPhone, use those earphones. They have a pretty decent microphone built into them that'll at least prevent any type of feedback. And But then, of course, when you're interviewing, that sucks because you have the microphone here. And if he's standing, you know, even three or four feet away, as you could tell when he was talking to Deuce, doesn't make for the greatest interview, Mike. So that's another reason, as John Solberg said earlier in Meathead segment, just because you can do Facebook Live doesn't mean you should do Facebook Live, <laughs> which I have been a live proponent of, by the way. 
And that's why I don't want to just go live on my phone. Like I could go live on my phone 15 times a day if I wanted to, but it's going to sound like crap. And I don't want to sound bad. There has to be things that are being developed right now that I'll be able to plug into an earphone hole and have a super quality sound or at least a, a nice sound. But he was in the back of a kitchen and we got to see what they were eating and you know, 50% of it was good. 50% of it was a loser. What are you going to do when you have never really tried it out? And we try things out on this show. And as I've said before, who knew the embedded correspondence segment was going to be such a hit? I had no idea. We've It's been such a hit. We've had to move it to a longer segment. It's still not long enough. So Meathead doing his best to help the show and not miss a date, which I certainly appreciate because he would have given me zero heads up that he was ditching for tonight, but, you know, whatever. So thank you to Meathead Goldwyn from AmazingRibs.com for efforting the almost whole two segments. Then his battery died. I don't know what he's going to do for the rest of the evening. How is he going to check Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus? Can't do it now. Yeah, that's a good question, too. By the way, uh, Matt Boer is going to be on later this month as well. Is it next week, Matt? And Matt has a lot of beer knowledge. A lot of people like beer. So if you have specific questions for Matt, send them in to me, Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. And we will ask Matt his expert opinion or get his expert take on certain things that are happening in the beer world. All right. We will get ready to wrap the first hour when we get back. I will talk to you quickly about the Pit Barrel Cooker. Folks, the uh, Pit Barrel Cooker is one of the easiest decisions to make. If you're looking at buying a new cooker and you want to have something that is economical, I think for $299 shipped to your door, put together, ready to cook on, I don't know how many other cookers are like that in that price range. The capacity on this cooker is kind of second to none, pretty much. The hook and hang method is unique. Placing the food in the center of the heat. So we all know what a rotisserie is, right? This is a version of, let's call it a stationary rotisserie. The result, great, ta great tasting, perfectly cooked meat each and every time. The thing that you have to get over immediately when we talk about the pit barrel cooker, once you get one, once you get those ribs on those hooks, you hook them on the rebar and you close the top, you're immediately starting to worry because you're like, oh, the tip that's opposite side the hook is too close to the coals. It's going to burn. I'm very nervous. Don't worry. However, the thermodynamics within that thing combine, combust, fire up, keep heat, all that stuff. I don't know how that happens. But the meat that is literally inches away, literally inches away from the cold does not get overcooked. In fact, it's cooked just as good as the side by the hook. Plus, eight racks of ribs that you can do in that thing. You can hook turkeys. You can hook multiple chickens. If you don't like to hook, you can put in the grill grate. It's got hinged grill grate, so you can reload the fuel if you need to. They recommend the charcoal briquettes. However, I have used lump charcoal without any issue. And then you just do one simple vent adjustment right when you get it. Lock it in there, and that's it. Assemble, close the top. You're ready to go. There's a bunch of cool accessories that come with the pit barrel cooker. For instance, they have their own rubs. They have their own stainless steel rub shakers that are really nice, easy to refill. Very nice, even spread when you're shaking the rubs out of them. And you can put any rub you want in them. If you have a whole bunch of different kind of rubs, you can dump the uh, pit barrel rubs out. You can use a different rub that you can refill as needed with the pit barrel stuff, whatever you like, doesn't matter. They have beer koozies or drink koozies. They have a coffee mug that is shaped like a little pit barrel, even with the little vent opening at the bottom. It's very cute. Plus a whole bunch of other items that complete the pit barrel cooking experience. Here's what you do. Head on over to pitbarrelcooker.com. That's P-I-T-B-A-R-R-E-L cooker.com. Pitbarrelcooker.com. See what everybody's talking about. Call them with questions. 502-228-1222 and they will talk to you. That's right. Customer service at its finest. Pitbarrelcooker.com. All right, we're back to wrap the first hour right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back.
Big name interviews, advice on cooking brisket and ribs, and the only host willing to share his honest opinion on all things important in the world of barbecue, it's the Barbecue Central Show. All right, welcome back. 216-220-0966 is the number to call. If you want to get in touch with me, Greg at the BBQ Central is the place to go. I think somebody said horse meat burn ends. Uh-oh. We're getting closer to that. I think that might have been Kinger. You might not want to hear it, but here in the States, yeah, that's who it is. Oh, horse meat burn ends. Jason King, you are the YouTube maven, my friend. And horse meat is legal in Canada. You produce barbecue burn ends. I'll give you the whole first hour. We'll talk about the whole thing. We'll run the video. We'll go over technique. Hell, we could stream it live. You could stream it live to YouTube. I could somehow break into your signal or tap into your phone at the same time. Broadcast it on my Facebook page. We would shake the North American continent to its very core. Horse meat burn ends. Is that illegal for me to do? Because it's illegal here, can I show it happening? Is that like a snuff film? I don't want to do that. But I will give you a whole hour. Not only that, I will give you the whole first hour of a show coming up, King. If you make horse meat burn ends legitimate, I want to see the horse. I want to see it butchered down. Once so you take that roast or horse brisket or whatever the hell it is, let's do this. Horse meat burn ends, King. You said it. You said it. Now let's make it happen. Let's blow up the internet. You know you want to do it, Kinger. You know you want to do it. Setting the barbecue and grilling world on fire. I got a lot of things to talk about. Got this email from Josh Poston. Greg, you do a great job on the show. I really appreciate the efforts in providing a show for backyard cooks as well as competition pitmaster. Do you have a show in the archives that talks about organizing a barbecue cook-off for fundraising purposes only? Question I have, who typically provides meat? What are the requirements for health standards? How does the prize money get dispersed? Is it even possible to raise money with a barbecue contest? Thanks for your help, and I look forward to your next podcast. Josh Posted. Josh, shout out. I believe the answer is no. We haven't specifically done a segment on the show that talks about doing barbecue competitions for the sole purpose of fundraising. But that is something that we should look into. I believe a good portion of barbecue competitions are trying to benefit a charity of some sort. So if you know somebody that is doing a barbecue competition, chances are they are tied into some kind of a charity. Typically, that's modus operandi for all barbecue competitions, or most of them, I guess. But we'll put something together. I'll have some of the great organizers of the day on, and we'll talk about how you can go about raising money in the form of organizing a barbecue cook-off, a fundraiser, if you will. Josh, I appreciate you listening, pal, and writing into the show. So look for that in a segment coming up soon, I guess, right? All right, uh, we're going to step away, reload for the second hour, and when we come back, we'll have Matt from Meat Church. We'll have Scott from Q and Stewing and Brewing. It's all sorts of fun left to go here in the second hour. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show right here on the Barbecue Central Network. Stick around. We'll be right back.
Happy to have you aboard here for the really big barbecue show. Boing. We cook because we have to, and we grill because we want to. Hit me. Fine. How you doing? <laughs> We have a great show of a big fan. Boing. So what 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 seems to be the problem here? This man looks like he's dead and he's in the in the crackle. Charbono! It's all about the Charbono, dude! Succulent fish! What? He ate two feet before we nerd. So listen, Laverne, you shut your face. I'm shaking like a dog shit peach seed. <laughs> we have top men working on it right now. All right, just like that, we are into the second hour, and welcome aboard to the Barbecue Central Show. If you're getting us on podcast, of course, you know what you're listening to. But if you're just tuning in live this evening, this is the show that talks about all things important in the world of barbecue and grilling. And I appreciate you joining me here for the last 60 minutes. If you missed the first 60 minutes, oh, what are you doing? Watching the Cavs game or something like that? I mean, who knows? <laughs> you can get it on podcasts. Go to iTunes. Subscribe that way. Go to Google Music or Google Play Music or whatever the hell they call it. Subscribe that way. Just search BBQ Central Show. Easy to do. Or other podcast aggregators. Please take the time. Make the effort. Never miss a second. Still to come on the show, Matt Pittman from Meat Church, Scott Smith from Q and Stewin in Bruin, Ronnie Knopf right here talking about doing a, an ID that was somehow not played at the top of the hour. Oh, timers are great until they don't work. The National Pro Barbecue Tour presented by Sam's Club represent, represented or wrapped up. Fully this past weekend, taking the overall national grand championship was whoa, somebody we talked to at 1035 tonight. Q and Stewin and Bruin, your national 2017 National Pro Barbecue Tour presented by Sam's Club champion. Q and Stewin and Bruin, congratulations. Reserve grand champion, Rocky Top Barbecue. There's an interesting, before I get to the rest of the top 10, there's an interesting tidbit that I will talk to Scott about in about 30 minutes from now. I don't want to give it away here, but it is something that if you aren't looking, you don't realize how many just like this competition happened over the course of not only this weekend, but weekends past this year. It seems like more than ever, but we'll talk about that with Scott a little bit later on in the show. Third place overall, Q-Bones BBQ with a 701.6, uh, Rocky Top with 702.83. Fourth place, Clark Crew Barbecue, Travis Clark and the team out there with a 700.5. The Victory Lane Barbecue with a 699.9. By the way, and I will mention this when we talk to Scott as well, Victory Lane Barbecue. Had not one, but two 180s, chicken and ribs, I believe. So congratulations going out to the folks over at Victory Lane. Sixth place overall, Good Smoke Barbecue. Seventh place overall, IBQing at the BBQSuperstore.com. Eighth place, Darren Worth and Sherry Worth, Iowa Smoky D's. Ninth place, The Smoke Hunters. And tenth place was my guest last week, Justin and Kate McGlawn. Lucky's Q. Uh, it was 702.84, I believe, won it. And your spread was seven points from one to ten. Maybe not even seven points. Or maybe just a little bit more than seven points. But, you know, there's been some Sam's Club series over the local and regional events where you had a seven-point spread just between one and two, and then you were well into the double digits just between one and six. But this is what happens when the cream rises to the top and you have 50 of the really good cooking Sam's Club teams show up in Bentonville and test their metal. And one through ten, six, I guess it was like six... 
six and a half points overall, uh, splitting between one and ten. So really cool. Very close. Five and six was six tenths of a point. Uh, six and seven was a hundredth of a point. Probably less than that. Very, very close. Another six tenths between eight and nine. Two points between nine and ten. Big blowout there. But wow. So that's it for Sam's Club for the rest of the year. Um, again, I believe it is guaranteed to be back next year, but we'll see what happens going on starting in 2019. So stay tuned for that. But next year should be back and appreciate them sponsoring the show for the duration of the Sam's or the National Pro Barbecue Tour Series this year. Here's something new. If you're looking to get into competition barbecue and you don't want to go anywhere and you have some time on your hands, might I suggest the Green Mountain Grills Barbecue Grill-Off first annual competition. The Barbecue Grill-Off participants will be competing in four categories. I bet you can guess. Ribs, pork, poultry, and beef. A grand champion and a reserve grand champion will be awarded along with individual category winners and a People's Choice Awards. Contest is running in U.S. and Canada. Here are the rules for entry submission. And we'll probably get Jason Baker or Andy Allen on here over the next couple weeks just to hype it up a little bit more. Entries must be submitted using the Facebooks, Instagram, the Twitter, through your personal account. All entries must include two photos, one of the final plated presentation and one showing the interior of the meat, which will allow the judges to see the execution. Ribs cannot be submitted for either beef or pork categories. All entries must include the hashtag GMG BBQ Grill Off and the category hashtag GMG Ribs, GMG Pork, GMG Poultry, GMG Beef. Second, tag Green Mountain Grills account in the post, Facebook and Instagrams at Green Mountain Grills, on the Twitter at GMG Grills. And then you have to name the dish with a brief description. And remember, if you're on some of those social medias, you only have 140 characters unless you were so lucky to get anointed with double to 80. But most of us are living in the 140 world. So you have to give a brief description, something like St. Louis style ribs seasoned with uh, butcher barbecue or BPS rub, cooked hickory smoke three hours, something, you know, something to get a point across. Okay. Here's an example. Hashtag GMG BBQ Grill Off, hashtag GMG Pork at Green Mountain Grills. BBQ Pork Sandwich, season it with my special pork rub marinated in apple juice overnight, slow cooked for eight hours. There's your example. Here's the calendar of events. And this started, what's the day's date? The 10th, I think. Yeah? No. Oh, cripes. Today is the 10th, 11th, 18th. Right. Yesterday was the 9th. Ribs started October 9th. Ribs will run October 9th through the 29th. So you have 20 days right now to cook your pork ribs. Then October 30th, which is the next day, October 30th through November 19th, you have to cook your pork entry. November 20th through December 10th, you have your poultry entry. And then December 10th through the end of the year, which is December 31st, you have to do your beef entry. Those are your dates. October 9th through the 29th for ribs, 30th through November 19th for pork, November 20th through December 10th, poultry, December 10th through December 31st, beef. There is a competition point system, which I'm not going to get into at the moment. There is judging. They brought top KCBS certified barbecue judges along with a guest judge. Big Mo Case on to score your entries. Judges will choose their top 15 entries for each category based on appearance and execution. After all judges have submitted their choices, the top 15 in each category 
will receive the points based on where they rank. The points will be tallied to determine the overall winner at the end of the contest. We'll also have an overall people's choice winner based on number of likes, shares, and post engagements. And if you are wondering what the prizes are, first place, you get a Daniel Boone model with Wi-Fi smart controller. Reserve Grand Champion gets the portable Davy Crockett with Wi-Fi smart controller. First place in each category, you get a whole bunch of really cool accoutrements. And the overall people's champion, again, you get a uh, whole bunch of like hats and mitts and, and all this other stuff. So, you know, very exciting stuff. Okay. It's very exciting. Matt Pittman is trying to call in. Matt, I'm going to hook, I'm going to call you uh, when we're ready here in just a couple minutes. So we'll get ready for that. So if you want to try your hand at a barbecue competition and take it slowly, go to greenmountaingrills.com slash grill dash off. I will have that in the show notes as well. Hey, for a whole month and a half, you could win a Daniel Boone grill. It's better than that for free, I might add. Just because cooking, a lot of us could be cooking in the winter. That might add some extra points. I'm not saying that it will, but if you're cooking in a blizzard... You know, Kinger cooks in the blizzard seven months out of the year because he lives in Canada. He might get some extra treatment for that. You never know. All right, folks, let me talk to you quickly about the Barbecue Guru. If you're looking to turn up the heat on your barbecue skills this summer, you're going to need to get your hands on the most advanced ceramic cooker and high-tech barbecue accessory to hit the market. I am, of course, talking about the all-new Monolith Barbecue Guru Edition and CyberQ Cloud just launched by the Guru. The world's first temperature-controlled ceramic smoker and grill with a built-in power draft fan. It's going to give you the easiest, most successful barbecue experience currently available on the market. These must-have new products will make barbecuing easier than ever before, and you will be able to have this secret weapon for cooking delicious food each and every time. Plus, if you have a barbecue guru controller already, you don't need to get anything else. Hook it right up to the fan. You're off and running just that easy. This ceramic grill has the power draft fan built into it. You don't have to aftermarket or retrofit or put insulation in there or anything like that. Forget it. The Barbecue Guru is the place to go. BBQGuru.com, the website. Call 800-288-GURU or visit the website BBQGuru.com, as I just mentioned. If you have any questions, call them 800-288-GURU. Don't guess. Ask the experts. They will get you what you need. Please do that. And bam. If you have the monolith grill and you're using it right now, I would love your feedback. Hit me up with an email or call into the show or call me offline. Call into the hotline. Leave a message. I'll play it on the air. Would love to hear what you think about the monolith. What's supposed to come with it? An incredible amount of accessories at no additional cost. BBQGuru.com, 800-288-GURU. We're back with Matt Pittman from Meat Church right after this. Stick around. I'll be right back. The only show giving you a monthly visit from a doctor of barbecue. A man actually named Meathead. The author of a barbecue Bible. Bloggers, reviewers, competitors, and manufacturers by the dozens. It's the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. As I mentioned in the first hour, the 2017 grant program for Smithfield was a raging success this season. So if you want your event to be considered for next year of 2018, head over to smokingwithsmithfield.com right now and apply for the 2018 grant program. Applications being taken now till October 25th. Don't miss out. Smokingwithsmithfield.com, the grant program. A lot of people wanted to get into that this year, but not everybody could be taken expanded for 2018, so your chances are better. Last week, Dr. Barbecue weighed in on the social media phenomena that is known as pork belly burnt ends. And while I believe that he does think that they are delicious, he believes that the term burn end should only be reserved for a dish that is produced from brisket and that this pork belly burn end is kind of a bastardization of the correct term. And a week or so ago, there was a little bit of a skirmish between Ray and my next guest. So I wanted to grab the other side and see what he has to say about it. He is a first timer to this show. He's incredibly popular on the social media. 
and barbecue merch and product sales and cooking classes, kind of doing it all right now. So let's go ahead and race to the hotline and welcome the creator of Meat Church based in Waxahachie, Texas. Matt Pittman joining me here on the show. Matt, how are you, buddy? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing absolutely fabulous. I can't believe I got Waxahachie, Texas right out the first time. Pretty impressive for a guy up north, right? No? Hello? You there, Matt? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Sorry about that. I uh, lost you there just for one second. So, uh, Matt, before we get into the burnt ends, pork belly burnt ends conversation, blah, 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 uh, you know, you have, at least from my perspective, a very interesting story, uh, how I get visibility of you, and I'm wondering, in a thumbnail kind of a sketch, are you able to give me a backstory on Meat Church, and where does the love of live fire cooking come from? Is it just because you were born and raised in Texas kind of a thing, and you're just around it, and it's in the culture and in the blood, or... How does that come about? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a pretty unique story, I guess. I was actually born in the South in Tennessee, raised a lot in Alabama. So I, I kind of grew up on pork, moved to Texas when I was 13. So I, I claim Texas at this point. Uh, but I've always just been kind of the outdoor cook. I mean, my grandmother uh, was a big Southern cook, had, you know, these massive meals that stretched the whole table after church. And so I always had an interest in cooking. And um I don't know. I got, I just, you know, when I got to Texas uh, early on in life, I mean, probably high school, I started kind of being the guy that would cook. Uh, I'm kind of known to tailgate a lot. With I've been going to Dallas Cowboys games for over 20 years, and I'm the cook out there. So I've just always kind of polarized to it and been that guy. So I didn't have anybody, anybody in my family training me or teaching me or anything like that. It's just kind of a, a fire that came from within. Plus, I got a name for it. It's kind of meant to be, I guess. Does Meat Church get born out of the love of live fire cooking? Was it some other kind of a business and formed into live fire cooking? How does that all come no, about? I mean, so it was honestly, it was an accident. I was uh, I was competing in barbecue with some buddies. And uh, it, at one point, uh, it's a pretty well chronicled story by now. I decided to go out on my own because uh, we were at a comp in Arlington, Texas. And one of my buddies, an electrician, and he reached in his pocket and pulled out a really used screwdriver and mixed up our sauce and said, try this. And uh, at that moment, I thought, I might want to get a little more serious about this. But uh, ironically, we actually won ribs that day. But at that moment, I peeled off on my own and uh, and went on. And so kind of had my brother helping me out. And, uh, and pretty early on, got picked to be on TV show Barbecue Pitmasters, I guess, because we had a pretty good following. And um, you know, took a couple of my rubs on there. Um, and you know, another w pretty well-known story. I, um, I didn't have rubs or sell rubs or a website or anything like that, but I made a couple rubs and I was buying a obscure ingredient that goes in one of my rubs at a place and, um, accidentally discovered he was a co-packer, didn't know what the heck a co-packer was. And <laughs> three weeks later I was in Tampa, Florida shooting the show with my own rubs. And four months later they released the show and, and they, they showed mine and, uh, Three and a half later, years later, here we are. Accidentally did pretty dang well out of it. Uh, it's not everybody that shows up on Barbecue Pitmasters, I guess, that sees the kind of success. Do you just chalk it up to being right place, right time? I mean, obviously, the products speak to themselves once you get them in your hands and you're trying them, but it's getting into those hands that's kind of crucial. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly work my butt off. I mean, I, I get up probably earlier than most and, and go to bed later than most. And so uh, I always tell people there's no shortcut to it. So um, I've been fortunate that, you know, we were seen, but you can't just be on there and become something. If I wouldn't have worked hard at it, it would have petered out. And by the end of the year, nobody would know who we are. In fact, a lot of people said, you know, you can leverage being on that show for about a year. Mm. Um, anyway, so it was just I think it just kind of validated us. But from there, it went from people trying it. And like you said, I, I think people like it or it wouldn't be where it's at today. And then. You know, I'm unique from everybody. We have a product, but I sell two things. I sell a, a seasoning and, and barbecue product, but then I kind of sell the personality and appearance and teaching and training and all that as well. So it's kind of complimentary. You have uh, almost 139,000 Instagram followers, and that handle is at Meat Church. Uh, tweeters around 11,000 or show, same handle at Meat Church. Social media is obviously very powerful, especially over the last handful of years. Did you realize right off the bat that social media was going to play a significant part in the growth of the brand? Well, no. I mean, I'd be lying if I said I did. I was an early adopter of Instagram, but, uh, you know, I did this festival three years ago and I had 485 followers on Instagram and I 
uh, Aaron Franklin was teaching a class and I was right behind him. And I, I looked at my wife and I said, I wonder what this festival will mean to our, our social media. And I tracked it and put it in my phone and I still have that note to this day. So it's kind of cool that, you know, no person has ever logged into my Instagram other than me. I've never bought a follower, never had an agency look at it and never got any advice from anybody. It's basically what I feel like cooking and I kind of market to myself and, and it clearly appears to resonate with the people. And I think has been a, a huge part of our success. When did you start getting into the product side of things? Was it simply because you had this rub and you, you met this guy kind of by chance and realized you learned what a co-packer is now, he's going to be able to give you products? I guess the better question is, once you know you have a line of rubs, you also have shirts and you also have hats and all this stuff. Is this just another stream of the Meat Church brand that you knew you're going to have to pump out in order to kind of have this brand growth and, and be a barbecue force? Well, when it started, when we launched the website, we had three rubs, two of which I took on the show and another I developed before the show launched. And I, I sold two shirts and two hats, uh, the set we wore on the show. And then I had another, I had a couple, I basically had all this stuff, launched it, sold six things that day. But I've always been kind of a creative person in my mind. I think I'm a wannabe marketing guy at heart. And so I, I really enjoy coming up with new designs. So all the stuff you see with our shirts, our hats, um, the art on our labels, the names, that all comes from me. Again, no one's ever been hired to do any of that. I do have to pay people to illustrate it for me because I'm not uh, creative enough to actually illustrate it, but they're <laughs> all my ideas. And, you know, I, like I said, I kind of go after, I think I'm the target for most grilling and barbecue companies. Like I'm who you want to sell to. So I just think what'll work for me and I go with it. So this year I was talking with Chad Ward at Traeger Grills. Said, you know, how do you think I can expand? And my line and and I, i'm not trying to be all things to all people and he and i talked a lot about expanding my merch and so that's one of the reasons i did it so i've got some really cool stuff i've got some kind of funny stuff um you know just some kind of random barbecue shirts and people seem to dig it so i'm gonna keep doing it and i have some super cool stuff coming out for christmas that comes out next month so that'll be exciting matt Pittman joining me here on the show from meat church matt do you ever feel any pressure or perhaps just like internal urgency from yourself to add more stuff because the iron's hot right now and uh, you know i guess it goes for both you and the industry i think from a backyard warrior sense barbecue and grilling hasn't been any more popular than it is right now you can realize that you've seen your growth over the last handful of years do you feel like you have to strike while the iron is hot or is that kind of begging too much from your customer base to just keep throwing shit out there and hoping that they buy it it's an interesting question because I can tell you that right now in October, I'm actually stressed because I know what I have to get out for the holiday season. And the holiday season for us is when we blew up. So when we knew we had something, it was Thanksgiving Day. My wife and I were at a Cowboys game, and she looked at me and she said, what did you do? And I said, what are you talking about? She had 54 orders. And that was kind of the day we really took off. And so um, Black Friday through Christmas is phenomenal for us. So. You know, I, I did release a new product uh, on Thanksgiving last year, and so I kind of like to follow that model. So I feel like I have to do certain things. You know, I also follow the Apple model. I don't want too many SKUs. And so that's why I said I'm not trying to be all things to all people. But I do feel pressure while the brand is hot and things are going on. I, I It's not that I have to have more and more and more, but, I you know, I want to keep people's attention. We released a rub in July. Nothing going on other than the peak of July, and, and we sold $30,000 in one day, and I was wow. blown away. So I've seen that you know, bringing new creative things to the market has been very good for us, so I do feel pressure to, to continue to do that. I assume Meat Church is a full-time job for you at this point? It's not, and that shocks Ooh. a lot of people. Wow. I mean, it is, but it's on top of a full-time I'm, I'm a vice president of a financial services company, and we operate Meat Church on the side, uh, but it is uh, – but that's through, you know, um, the family business that we run. And I've got a lot of family members that are employees and work for us. So it's it certainly should be full time for me if it weren't for a good career in front of it. Uh, have you ever thought about divorcing one from the other and just being full time meat church guy and, and seeing if you could yeah. even grow it more or no? Yeah, it's, it's very tempting, but my career is really good. And I have four kids, two in college. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult proposition walk walk away from but the question i get more is is why don't you have a restaurant because i do so many festivals and events and got a food and wine festival coming up where i'll hear that all the time and i you know it's tempting but then i think i've built the brand and revenue that those guys seek and i don't have to be married to a restaurant so um obviously i'd love to work for myself uh, at some point but right now we're going to keep double dipping my oh, man i've seen your backyard screw the restaurant I'll tell you that <laughs> screw it 
Uh, you know, we were yeah. talking about social media a few minutes ago. A few weeks back, you and Dr. Barbecue had uh, a little back and forth on this highly popular pork belly burnt ends subject. And, uh, of course, Ray maintains the fact that perhaps while these are delicious, and I don't know if anybody would argue that, because they're not coming from a brisket, you can't use them in the term burnt ends because by the very definition, it's not a burnt end. One's pork, one's beef, and the real burnt ends come from beef. So give me your thought process on this. Does Ray have a valid point in any way? Is he way off base? Should there be some respect for barbecue definitions of the past? Should we be open to change? What's the meat church take? So, yeah, I mean, everybody's entitled to their opinion. I don't think he's right and I'm wrong or vice versa and uh, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second but let me let me say first off i am a purist i'm a historian guy i'm a very um you know when i when the way i teach barbecue i tell people i'm wood meat fire i'm old old school salt and pepper texas barbecue uh, so i'm the last guy that wants something crazy uh in fact when i was on pit masters we were given a brisket flat and i chose not to make burn-ins because you can't make burn-ins out of a flat and the other right. two competitors made them one did well one got made fun of frankly so clear on that just understand where they came from Burn city arthur bryant here's my issue so first off you know ray is a little controversial and can be known to be a bit of a jerk at times and and that's fine he's earned his right to do that well let's back up so two weeks ago i did uh, pork belly burn-ins on local news channel someone posted the video someone tagged ray and said hey he wouldn't agree these are pork belly burn-ins and ray chimed in and you know gave his piece and i said well hey i feel like the Meat Church congregation is a big group. I've got a, I've got a voice, and I think it's finally time to kind of step up against him and say, Ray doesn't get to make the rules. Mm. And what I mean by that is he doesn't get to decide what things are called going forward. I'm not calling it a burn-in. I said, I said there, I can see it both ways. In fact, that weekend, I made a dish called pork belly with jalapeno relish. I didn't call it a burn-in. But I explained to him, and he's yet to address this, I can see how you take a big piece of meat, you cook it, you cube it, season it, sauce it, put it back on the pit. In the method of a burn-in, kind of like a chicken fried steak, and you use chicken fried breading on something else like chicken fried bacon, I'm referring to it as a method. So I can understand why people would want to call it a pork belly burn-in, and I have no issue with it. I personally have called it both. Um, I've been cooking pork belly for years. Uh, my buddy Travis Heim here in Fort Worth makes a pork belly burn-in that's extremely popular, probably landed him on the Texas Monthly Top 50 this year. I don't know his method and how he does it, but if you follow this method, I see nothing wrong with it. And in my issue with Ray on Twitter that day, he won't address it. He he would retweet my tweets and, you know, he would tweet out things like or he would send pictures of coffee cups and say coffee burn ins or tofu burn ins. That's ridiculous. That's not what I'm talking about. Take the meat, follow the process. And I don't care if you call it that or not. But at the end of the day, the country's spoken. I think it's pretty obvious what they're called at this point. <laughs> Just go to Google and type it in. Is is there a traceable history that you know of when pork belly burnt ends were introduced? Has someone been given or taken credit for the item? Well, I'll tell you what I know. So so Travis and I, Travis Heim and I, you know, we used to have lunch and talk pork belly all the time. We both cooked it a lot. He opened a trailer and started selling bacon burnt ends. And that's and I'd never heard of it. Um <laughs> I've since saw that someone might have been cooking it previous, but he's the first one I knew that was doing it around here. And it is extremely popular in Texas, particularly in Fort Worth. I mean, it's, he is very, very, very well known for it. They're iconic, frankly, at this point. Um, you know, I don't know his method. I know my method and why I'm okay calling it a pork belly burn-in because of how I'm doing it. So, Justin, just to recap very quickly, it's more of a, a method versus anything else. In your estimation. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're cooking brisket burn-ins, they come off the point, the fatty part, right? So the idea is you cook this brisket till it's done, then you take the fattest part, you cube it, you season it, sauce it, put it back in the in the in the pit to continue to render that fat out. Well, pork belly is even fattier than the point on a brisket, mm -hmm. right? It's like the fattiest meat you could ever eat in your life. So, you know, when I heard the term, I thought it kind of works and 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 went with it. But now, like I said, you look on social media now and it's and it's all over. So Two weeks ago, I was on record saying, I don't care what you call it. I don't care if you go one way or the other. And then, you know, now I think I'm going to stake my claim and say we're going with it. So here's here's my opinion. You're a very creative guy. You have a lot of great ideas. You've proven out success in business here. Isn't there something cooler that we could call these things other than pork belly burn ends? For instance, swine cubes. What about swine cubes? Is 
Doesn't it have a good ring to it? Or, or I, 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 my official Tennessee embedded correspondent, Steve Ray, the uh, pitmaster of Owl's Nest Barbecue in Ottawa, Tennessee, calls them pork belly buttons. Now we're talking. This is real creative stuff instead of just, you know, re, uh, rehashing a burnt end, if you will. Swine cubes. I mean, come on. You know you're going to be using that tomorrow. Hashtag swine cubes. Well, you know, honestly, I have to give Travis the credit. When I heard <laughs> when I heard bacon burn in, that's where it resonated in my head the first time. So, you know, I certainly give him credit for that. And like I said, I honestly feel like at this point, October 2017, I think the ship has sailed. I think they blew up so much this summer. And people that I develop recipes for, I said, hey, you, you know, you might want to publish this because it's all over. And it's super easy to make. So I feel like it's really the concrete is setting at this point. Here's... The last question on pork belly burnett. It is, as you said, a it's a complete phenomenon. A lot of things in the barbecue world come out of left field just like this. They hit quick and boom, they're gone. Will we even be talking about pork belly burnets by the end of the year? I think we will be, uh, and I think there's a few reasons why. One, it's super popular. Two, it's uncured bacon, and the bacon craze hasn't gone anywhere. Oh, so. No. You know, and it's cheap. That's the other thing. Uh, and I make it a couple different ways. It's something anybody can make. They're really good. I mean, I, you put a lot of barbecue out at a party and people go to pick things up. These are things you can hit with a toothpick. They can act as an hors d'oeuvre. You can serve a few of them as a meal. You can put it on a sandwich. It's really versatile. And so I, I don't think it's going away. What's your best recipe to share with people? Well, uh, so on meatchurch.com, I have the recipe, and I kind of stay on there. I do it both ways, which is either cook the pork belly whole until it's about 190, then cube it, season it, sauce it, put it back on the pit for about an hour. Obviously, you have to use my seasoning. The best pork belly burn-ins are made with meat church honey hog. Of course. Just, just me on that. <laughs> um, and so, and then you put them back on the pit for about an hour and a half. A lot of people now I see are cutting them in advance, so they're cubing the pork belly raw. That's fine. That's actually what the most recent recipe I put out shows to do. It's a little more difficult, in my opinion, to deal with because you've got these, you know, 75 raw cubes all over the place. Unless you have a rack to put them on, it's kind of a mess. Both work. Uh, we are talking with Matt Pittman. He is the creator of Meat Church. On the Twitter, he's at Meat Church. On Instagram, where the following is huge, he's at Meat Church. I really appreciate the time tonight, man. Thanks so much for coming on, and uh, we'll do it again sooner than later. Yeah, I certainly appreciate you having me. You got it. There he is. It's Matt right. Pittman from Meat Church. That's right. How about that? Love it. All guests on the Barbecue Central Show appear via the Smithfield Hotline. Yummy. And I think uh, while the pork belly burnt end in its culinary form might not be going anywhere, the conversation about is it a pork belly burn end or isn't has now seen its end of time. The conversation on pork belly burn end has run its course, and uh, that's going to be that. Until I get to the next segment and I ask Scott Smith about it. But then for sure, that's going to be it. I will stick to my guns and say, uh, probably while you can't rename pork belly burn ends at this point, swine cubes are way cooler. Give me instant reaction in the chat room. Swine cubes or pork belly burn ends? Swine cubes is also shorter and easier to say. Swine cubes. Sounds like something you could stick in a drink or eat. Swine cubes. I, I'm going to start it. I'm going to somehow I'm going to take over the pork belly burn ends with swine cubes. Hashtag swine cubes. Check it out. If you see it anywhere, screenshot it and send it to me so I can start legal processes. I have a lawyer on retainer. A fleet. Folks, Big Papa Smokers, the one-stop online shop for all things barbecue. Their curated selection of the best outdoor cooking and grilling supplies will get you on the path to better barbecue results in no time. Everything at Big Papa Smokers has been pitmaster approved by Sterling Ball himself. From award-winning rubs and sauces to the American-made grills and smokers, Big Papa Smokers has everything you need to become a better outdoor cook. Whether you're a backyard barbecue fanatic or a competition pro, Big Papa Smokers has something for you. Looking to improve the flavor of your competition barbecue recipes? How about the West Coast offense? Over the past few years, this recipe, darling, has cornered the market on competitive barbecue, begun to redefine the flavor profiles that competitive cooks from across the country have begun to aim for. 
Big Papa is also the proud owner of the award-winning Granny's Barbecue Sauce. Looking for a new go-to barbecue sauce that will please everyone? Granny's traditional yet powerful flavor remind us why we fell in love with barbecue in the first place. Find Granny's Barbecue Sauce and other top-rated barbecue sauces at BigPapaSmokers.com. And besides all of the great rubs and sauces, they have great charcoal, pellet, and wood-fired grills as well. How about the Mac Two Star General Pellet Grill, Big Papa Smokers? The exclusive Mac dealer even offers special packages. Not a fan of pellet cookers? No problem. Look at the Old, His uh, Old Hickory Ace BP. It's the only charcoal smoker that Big Papa trusts on his competition barbecue trailer. And if you're a backyard barbecue enthusiast looking for a durable, versatile grill that will last forever, the M Grill from Texas is just what you need. They're built like tanks. Not sure what kind of grill you need? You can't go wrong with the grills and smokers featured for the barbecue uh, bigpopsmokers.com they have something for every kind of backyard cook check out their website today shop their full selection folks it's clear that big papas is, is the place to go for all things barbecue every product on their website hand selected to help you barbecue better boost your barbecue skills with the help of big papa smokers the number one online barbecue store call them toll free at 877 828 0727 or shop their website at bigpapasmokers.com that's b-i-g P-O-P-P-A, smokers.com. And we are back with Scott Smith from Q and Stew and Bruin to recap the big win at the National Pro Barbecue Tour this past weekend. Stick around. Be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Craig Rampey. Thanks again to Matt Pittman for coming on this past segment. A portion of this show is being brought to you by CookinPellets.com. Your number one source for quality wood pellets. For all of your pellet-driven cookers, it's not going to void any warranties. Don't fall for that crap. If anybody tells you that, email Chris Becker. He will help you out. You can also buy these pellets at Amazon.com. But be careful from there because sometimes the shipping prices are incredibly high, especially if they're running low at Amazon. But just download the CookingPellets.com app and you'll be taken care of from there. Hey, this past weekend, the National Pro Barbecue Tour held its national finals in Bentonville, Arkansas. The top 50 teams that went through a local and regional round prior to the national finals faced off to see who would reign supreme. And when the <clears throat> bad pun smoke cleared, a score of 702.84 was good enough for GC. Here to recap the weekend and the win. Pitmaster for Q and Stew and Brew and Scott Smith joining me here on the show. Scott, how are you, buddy? Good, sir. How are you? Absolutely fabulous. Appreciate you making time for the show this evening. Uh, Scott, before we get into the weekend's events, can you tell us the, your path or the QSB path to Bentonville, Arkansas? Our path this year started in February in Daphne, Alabama, where we finished, I think, seventh or eighth. We did not qualify. But on the open sign up, we signed up for Marietta, Georgia, which is here, basically my hometown. We GC'd that event to move on to the regionals in Bartlett, Tennessee, where we finished sixth. And you got to move on, or you got to be top 10 to move on to the finals. So you end up in Bentonville. Have you made it to the finals before in, in previous years, Scott? Yes, sir. I've been there six out of the seven years to finals. Wow. Okay. So uh, almost every single year. When you head to Bentonville, uh, when do you leave out of Georgia to load in? We actually leave here on Wednesday because they want you to load in on uh, Thursday. We have a Thursday night party and a banquet there. And, uh, we left on Wednesday and arrived there Thursday before noon. Is that a, a fairly close barbecue competition for you, or do you usually like to stay within a, a certain radius of HQ? Uh, normally, I'll travel outside of my box usually two or three times a year. Bentonville's 13 hours for us, um, but it's worth the drive to go there every year. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I had Lucky's Q on last week in advance of this event. And Justin mentioned that the finals, I mean, I guess on, on the whole, the Sam's Club events, local or regional or, or final for this instance, typically 
tempered as far as partying goes, all this stuff. And he says once you get to the finals, it's usually more or less a ghost town when it comes to the nighttime activities. Did you find that to be the case this time around in Bentonville as well? Mm, no. I mean, there's a, there's some cooks that are normally that way. You know, year-round, no matter where they are, actually went around Friday night. And I don't know, I was out till at least 11 and oh. made a lap around the lot and stopped and actually saw probably 25 or 30 of the 50 teams there. We're talking with Scott Smith from Kewen, Stewen, and Bruin. Anything happen over the course of the weekend once you commence to cooking, Scott, that you weren't planning for, or that happens unexpectedly that you have to contend with? No, it was uh, just a pretty normal day. We pretty much kind of same cook we would do anywhere we go. From a results standpoint, chicken third place, but you hear third and it's a little misleading. It's a perfect 180 in chicken. Ribs 40th, pork fifth place, brisket second place. Obviously, we can address the ribs here in a second, but overall, were you guys pretty happy with the turn-ins? And did you think that where you were slotted w was fair or the judges award or, or take away? No, I think the whole thing was fair. I mean, and I think that though of every event, I'm pretty easy going there. There's, you know, when you're dealing with the, taste bad to someone it may or may not be pleasing to their palate and week in week out there's going to be generally some tables that's better than others generally some tables that may be a little worse than others i think sam's all across the board has been pretty fair that i've been to and all of the national events have uh certain have master judges they have like 180 judges apply they only bring in 50 master judges which have judged over 30 events and I pretty much think those guys probably know what they're doing. I mean, they've scored me everywhere from 40th to first over the last six years. So. <laughs> I've been there. Scott, if we could, I mean, perfect 180 and chicken, fifth and pork, second and brisket. Um, do we just chalk up to ribs to hitting a bad table? Or did you have uh, not a bad time with well, ribs, but did you think ribs were 40th? I was unsure. I don't normally eat very much, if any, food when I cook. <laughs> uh, my ribs had an off color. I noticed only maybe 30 minutes into the cooker, they had a grayish look, I suppose, where they wanted to turn a little more red. And my son even noticed it. He, uh, he said, Dad, those look gray. And I said, yeah, they do. They'll come around. But as far as everything else goes, I thought it was very normal, but I just don't eat a lot when I'm, you know, I rarely eat anything before it goes into the judging. Is that just experience and running a consistent program for so long where you're just hitting the, the marks on that program and there's no need to taste or... Are you potentially doing yourself any type of a disservice by not catching something you might be able to tweak at the very end before you run it into the tent? Uh, I think I can tell a lot just by the way the knife goes through most things. Um, chicken is a it's a go to category for USB. We've been in the top of chicken nationwide, I guess, for at least four years, mm -hmm. and my chicken's very consistent. I don't normally eat a, I cooked 12 legs. I mean, six of them go in the box. I don't even normally touch a piece of chicken until at least five after. That way it gives my chicken the same time to set as it does theirs. But when you've got 12 legs laying there and it's turn in time, I mean, there's not a whole lot of tweaking you can do. If I ate one and didn't like it, I'm still going to turn some chicken in that day. So I just figured I'd enjoy the, the call one at the end, which I normally do. But this weekend we did not. How long have you been doing legs versus the more preferred thighs? I've done legs uh, since 2012, and we were team of the year with legs in 2014. I think there's only one other team that I can sit here and name off the top of my head uh, that has turned in legs uh, fairly recently. Uh, by the way, and I'm not meaning to kick this guy in the balls, they finished dead last in chicken, by the way. <laughs> 
<laughs> at Sam's Club. Uh, that, that was uh, Bob Trudnack over at the Barbecue Guru, who I believe, who had he either won a Sam's Club regional or like reserve or something like that. And, and his secret in chicken was the legs. And I think that was the game plan going down this weekend. I don't know exactly what happened for him to finish last, but quite the dichotomy to have a, a perfect 180 legs and then a DAL in legs. Um, do you find ch- uh, that cooks are going more two legs, or do you still kind of stand out as, a, as an oddball of sorts? No, I think legs has been around for quite a while because if you go all the way oh. back to 2010, five out of the last six years, team of the year has been legs. Hmm. That's nationwide. When you are called for grand champion, some of those initial emotions that wash over you and the team, what's going through your mind? Uh, it was a, my son was with me. He's never been there. Um, in fact, all six times I've been, there's been a, someone different with me all six times. And <laughs> it was great to have him there for that moment. And I've never been drawn for the Jack. I had grands every year and never been pulled. I've only cooked the Royal once. This is kind of the major event for us and has been uh, every time we've been. It is, you know, it, it's our top barbecue contest. If I had a choice to go win one, I would I would pick Sam's over the other three majors every day. Wow. But there's a, I don't know, hell, I, I cried. It was just that emotional for me and my son to be there and to have him there and enjoy that moment that he'll never forget, cherish for the rest of his life. It was uh, pretty emotional, and, you know, it was totally unexpected because I've been in comps before to where I've had a 180 and two top fives and finished, you know, 12th or 13th. <laughs> um, I'm that guy. I've, I've DAL'd things and <laughs> had categories that just go away for some odd reason and, you know, had three or four solid goals and not uh, – or three solid goals and not make the top ten. From a payday perspective, what is QSB's take for the weekend? We were fifty-seven thousand seven hundred fifty. Wow, fifty-seven. And then uh, you did you say you took a grand in the regional too? So, like, what from uh, from all of yeah. your uh, Sam's experiences this year? What's your total takeout? A grand did a local. Uh, probably in the neighborhood of 75. Wow. So from a serious standpoint, pretty big friggin' payout. Oh, very. I mean, Sam's <laughs> has been noted for seven years for their payouts. And, uh, you get that 1099 at the end of the year. They've been very good to us for seven years. We've been very fortunate. Last year, I won brisket there and finished third or fourth. And, uh, that's still a big payday. You know, when you win a, Four or five thousand dollar category, and a six seven thousand dollar third place, and then a thousand dollar rib to go along with it. It's uh, it's always a big payday with him. It seems like a softball question for me to ask Scott, but I never know what the answer is going to be anymore after doing ten years of the show. Does this win classify as the biggest win for the team to date, or is the first one that you ever got still the most special, or are they kind of like kids? Uh, everyone's kind of special and different in their own way? Well, any win is, is always special and great, but this is by far our greatest achievement and our biggest win. It does, it casts a shadow on all of the other wins we've had. We've been very fortunate we've won a lot of kind of this. This is by far the biggest. Scott, victory lane smoker grabs two Perfect scores. Chicken, he was one of the, I, be, I think Chicken had three perfect scores. Uh, he also gets one in ribs, gets fifth overall. Seemed that a lot of the teams that finished in that top five, top six, did really well, except maybe one, sometimes two categories. And I think that just kind of goes to show you that overall consistency is the key and that even two perfect scores, and you kind of just alluded to it too a couple minutes ago, doesn't necessarily guarantee you the win or a reserve. It does not. I have uh, reserved and then third, fourth, and fifth in a lot of contests that I've won two categories in. That's 
doesn't guarantee you a win. He did have uh, he had an awesome chicken. He was one ahead of us. He was uh, second place one eighty, and he also had a second place one eighty in red. And anytime you come out of the gate with two one eighties, I mean that's three hundred sixty points on the board out of a possible seven twenty. You've got a field advantage, and uh, it really looked good for Heath at that point. And I think if you were sitting there amongst the other fifty teams, it, <laughs> it looked big in their eyes because I don't know that that's ever happened, especially at that level. I have to tell you, Scott, as I review some of the scores from this event, but also take a look around some of the other KCBS competitions uh, this weekend, also this year, a lot of close finishes, certainly this past weekend for you, no different. You and Rocky Top separated by a hundredth of a point, maybe a little less. Does it make it all the more sweet for you, or would you rather steamroll by 15 or 20 points if you could choose? Well, everybody wants to steamroll if they can, but that's... uh... (laughs) That's not how it always happens. I mean, there's there's always that uh, moment. We had we had another moment very similar to this this year, and uh, Rome Georgia we won three categories: that first place rib, first place chicken, first place brisket. And I think that's a fork down there into the thirties and forties. You know, you think with three first place, it's an automatic, but it was less than a point. Is this one? the closest it's ever been for you to take grand championship? No, I actually lost a grand to a coin toss. Uh, Donnie Bray and I with Warren County Court Chopper mm-hmm. both had 702.440s or something in Cookville, Tennessee, two years ago. And I think we were the first team to ever tie for grand grand. I actually lost a grand to a, to a computer-generated coin toss. How does that smack you? <laughs> you know what? If it was anybody other than Donnie, it might smack me harder, but we had a great time with it. Uh, I think we had some cocktails that evening, and uh, it gave us a story that we still talk about today, and so do several other teams. And Anytime you put a 700 plus on the board, I think you accomplished, whether you win, lose, or draw, you, you've accomplished. You've done the best you can do that day to go to Sam's for the last two years in a row. My last year's score, I think, beat my this year's score. I had a seven last year there. And just to do that two years in a row was another, just an accomplishment that, that I think about as a pick. And when you're going up against 50 of the best teams in the world, and you can post a 700 two years in a row, that really speaks volumes for my comp. Scott Smith from Q and Stew and Bruin here on the phone. Scott, where are you guys going to be competing at next? We are in Lyons, Georgia this weekend. It's nope. one of our Georgia events. Only a couple of hours from here. A little town down by Vidalia, Georgia, where the Indians are. And we'll be there this weekend. He is the reigning National Pro Barbecue Tour through Bentonville, Arkansas this past weekend. It's Scott Smith from Q and Stew and Bruin. Scott, congratulations again. Thanks so much for taking the time to do the show tonight. Well, thank you very much, sir. Thanks for having us on. You got it. There he is. The Pitmaster of Q and Stewin and Bruin. on the Barbecue Central Show will appear via the Smithfield Hotline. Yummy. That was not the closest (laughs) barbecue competition that he has been a part. Can you imagine? Right. Losing to Donnie Bray in the coin toss. You, a couple years ago, people were just losing to Donnie Bray, period. That, that might have been the year he won team of the year. Hey, folks, Cook Shack manufactures smoker ovens for barbecue lovers with any amount of experience. Whether you barbecue in the backyard, in the competition circuit, In a five-star dining facility, Cook Shack has the unit that will do the job. And with a full line of barbecue sauces, spices, pellets, and wood chunks, it's the perfect one-stop shop. Cook Shack strives to be your barbecue resource center by offering cooking classes, online recipes, how-to videos, two blogs, smoke and grilling 101s, and a video cooking classroom. Check out their website at cookshack.com or follow them on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, and Google+. Get advice or share your passion for barbecue on their world-class barbecue forum. Cook Shack pellet-fired smokers are the choice of champions because they were designed by a champion, Ed Fast Eddie Morin. 
The FEC 100 and PG 1000 are always customer favorites. The PG 1000 can double as a smoker and grill. Low and slow, hot and fast, the pellet grill line gives you the most for your money. Cookshack residential electric smokers are the number one smoker in the industry. High quality means high durability and versatility. Basically, anything you can cook in your oven, you can make in a Cookshack. Passion and dedication drives Cookshack's manufacturing with quality always being at the forefront. Get the best in barbecue since 1962. Call 800-423-0698. That's 800-423-0698 or visit cookshack.com. All right, we're back to wrap the show right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. Whole packers, full racks, legs and thighs, injecting butts. If you've never heard this before, you might think you've found the best Triple X show ever. Let's get back to the most homoerotic host out there today, Craig Rimpy. All right, welcome back. John Dawson weighing in on the email in regards to renaming Pork Belly Burnens. His submission, Hog Raisins. How about Hog Raisins? I like that. Not as good as Swine Cubes. That's all mine. All mine. Swine Cubes. Again, Steve Ray from Ottawa, Tennessee says pork belly buttons. I think that's too long. That's like pork belly burnt ends, pork belly buttons. I say drop the pork belly reference altogether. Let's just assume we know what we're talking about. Swine cubes. Check it out. Swine cubes 2018. It's going to be my new hashtag t-shirt coming out next year. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up all the way back in the first hour. We talked with Meathead Goldwyn. He was on location at the Sweet Baby Ray's restaurant in Wooddale, Illinois. It was kind of a live coverage event. I think we've determined was 50% good, 50% crap. From a coverage standpoint, not from a Meathead content standpoint. Then, in the second hour, we talked with Matt Pittman from Meat Church. We put to bed the pork belly burn ends discussion that he had with Ray Lampy, Dr. Barbecue. Uh, Matt stated that uh, he thinks, A, pork belly burn ends are going to be around for at least a while. The name is not going to change. And in the end, the conversation was really more about the method of cooking than anything else. His website is meatchurch.com. That'll be in the show notes as well. And then we close the show with Scott Smith from Q and Stew and Brew and talking about the big national victory at the National Pro Barbecue Tour presented by Sam's Club. He is your national champion this year. And winning it after going six of the seven years. So congratulations to him. Got to share that moment with the son. Very good. Big show planned already next week. It's actually already filled up. Love it. Great content. It's going to be fun and exciting. I hope you're going to join me. September 11th, 2001. I will never forget. And until next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, this is your program host and proud U.S. American, Greg Rempe. Good night now.